tonight. We thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to come into this place and offer our praise and thanksgiving to you. Lord, we crown you with praise tonight. King of kings and Lord of all.
are holy, you are righteous, mighty, nobody like you, Lord. You alone reign. Are you glad tonight that you know that he is holy? He is wonderful. He is everything that we need him to be. Amen. It's not in man to direct his path. We can't make ourselves holy no matter how much we try. We can't really improve much on our fallen nature. But if we surrender our hearts and our lives to God and allow His Holy Spirit to inundate every part of our life, every crevice, every corner, every bit of our heart, He'll change our thinking, He'll change the words we speak, He'll change the decisions we make. And before long, we get around people, they'll say something like, there's something different about you. Yeah, it's the Lord. It's not, it's not in us. It's not because of us. It is in us, but not because of us. It's because He is holy, and everything He touches is better. Are you glad you know Him tonight? Let's lift our hands one more time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your holiness, your presence, your wonderful touch, God, in our lives. Lord, we need you. We love you. We want you, Lord. We want to hear your voice. We want to surrender ourselves to you, Lord. God is so good. God is so, so, so good. We want to put the prayer request up on the board. We've got a multitude of needs in the, among the saints of the living God. Look at all those names. Every one of those people is a, represents a need things that only God can do. Why don't we go to the Lord right now and let's ask for him to undertake. Lord, you are the God that answers prayer. Lord, you are the one that has every answer that we need, Lord. When we're in crisis, we don't depend upon the doctor as much as we depend upon you. God, we don't depend upon the banker as much as we depend upon you. We don't depend upon our own counsel as much as we depend upon the counsel of the Lord. God, we need you. We're not ashamed to admit the fact that we need you to touch, to help, to save, to deliver. And we bring these needs to you right now in Jesus' name. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. We want the ushers to go ahead and come on down. We're going to receive our Wednesday evening tithe and offering. We want to make you aware of a few things you do realize. We, I mean, we heard two great messages on Sunday. We heard our pastor and we heard our senior pastor. And what two great messages. And they were preaching to us about moving forward. Well, guess what? We can actually put that to practice this coming Sunday. We can move our clocks ahead forward. And we're an hour ahead. You're, you're a winner just walking into church Sunday morning because you'll be an hour ahead. You'll be an hour forward. Look at that. Praise God. And if you don't do that, well, we'll see you late, I guess. Neon Egg Hunt is coming up quickly, so be aware of that. And uh, we just love to have fun around here. We love to have fun and glorify the Lord and do good things. Fellowship of God's people. Isn't it wonderful to be a part of the church of the living God? Can you say amen? Amen. Brother Clyde T is going to play some given music. Come on up. Empty your wallet. Empty your purse. And let's be a blessing to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name.
come to you and you know he's worthy. Not just because they said so, but because you say so. Amen. How many of you know that he is worthy? Amen. I'm thankful tonight that that's the God that I serve. Amen. Who's allowed us to all be here in his house together tonight. Amen. Thankful to be in the house of the Lord with all of God's people. Amen. So good to have Adriana home tonight and she'll be here for a few days. We're so glad she's here. Amen. Amen. Exciting time around here. Lots of things coming up very quickly. Uh, one thing I want you to be mindful of, everybody say next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we're going to have a special guest speaker. And I know that you will not want to miss out. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful night next Wednesday night. So make sure that you're here and tell others to be here as well. You might need to remind some people we have church on Wednesday nights. I know it's hard to get here, but I, I cannot imagine not being able to come here on Wednesday night. It's that little bit that just helps push us through till Sunday. And I'm thankful for every opportunity we have to be together. Also coming up very, very quickly is Easter Sunday. Amen. It's always a wonderful, wonderful time around Greater Life Church. And I don't ever want us to just rush through that season because Easter Sunday is one of those days that people show up to church. And they show up and come for Christmas and Easter. We've said it before, they know he lived and they know he died. But it'd be good that they come and stick around and know that there's so much more to him than that. But Easter Sunday, our theme is going to be canceled. Easter Sunday is not canceled. Don't get it confused. So when you're inviting somebody and helping us promote, inviting them for that Sunday, let them know Easter Sunday is not canceled. And if they want to find out more about what we're talking about, just tell them they'll need to show up. Amen. Easter Sunday. Invite them. Be a great opportunity. They're going to go somewhere. It might as well be Greater Life Church. Amen. Amen. So thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Well, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Read verses 4 through 7. Amen. He said, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Verse 4 in the message says, Even if it was written in Scripture long ago, you can be sure it is written for us. Even though it may be outdated to some, I'm still thankful that I have the Word of God at my disposal. Verse 6, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. He said that through these two things you might have hope. So tonight, for just a few moments, I want to speak to you on this subject. God's two-for-one special. God's two for one special. These two things for hope. This patience and comfort for hope. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your presence that is in this place. I pray right now that you would anoint the lips of clay, God, that not one word would be wasted, not one moment of our time, God, that we would squander. But, Lord, we would make the most of every opportunity we have in your presence. God, help us to realize what a precious gift we have in your word. God, and what those scriptures represent to us tonight. God, we are thankful for the word of God. It is a light to our path. God, it guides us every day. Where would we be without that word? We give you glory and honor and praise tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You can be seated tonight. 
there are things in this life that if you take them and you put them together with something else, it just makes something wonderful. Most of us in here, whether we know it or not, have played a game called word association. If you know what that is, raise your hand. All right, almost everybody in here. Good. Well, we're going to play tonight, all right? If I were to say peanut butter, you would say jelly, right? If I say chips, you would say salsa dip. I knew there'd be some of both there. We've got some Texans in the house. King and macaroni and salt and Ah, uh, no Christians in the house. I thought you'd say salt and light. <laughs> salt and pepper. Pencils and socks and washer and hugs and pots and... Man, y'all are really good at this game. There are some things that just automatically go together. Sometimes it just rolls right off the tongue. That It just makes sense that this goes with that. And without that, there is no this. It just makes a beautiful combination. And Paul writing here, and he's giving us a great example of how to live our lives. And he's saying, first off, the first great example I'm going to point you to is Jesus Christ himself. There's no better example on how to live your life. But also, I want you to know that if you would go to the scriptures, that it would help you with your patience and comfort. And those two things together are going to give you hope. That if you would take them and apply them to your life, it's going to do something wonderful for you that without them you otherwise would not have. Paul writing here, he gives that example and he says, this is going to help you to be like Jesus. We sang that song, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask to be like him. It's a whole lot easier to sing that song than it is to apply that to your life and to truly be like Jesus. When somebody does you wrong and somebody cuts you off, do you be like Jesus? When somebody's hollering at you in your face and poking you in the forehead, it's really hard to be like Jesus in that moment and turn the other cheek. We like to sing it, and boy, it makes us feel all good inside, but when it comes to the application process of it, well, how, how much do I really have to be like Jesus? Where, where is that? I'm not perfect. I'm not God. So there's got to be a line there that I can find that's okay for me. No, I ought to be challenged every day to be more like him. Our job as Christians is to live in that way and to be like Jesus. And There are times where that is very challenging. People in life, they will test you and they will push you and push you and push you. And they will get you all riled up and you'll be so mad and then it'll stop and say, why are you mad? Calm down. And that's the worst thing you could tell somebody when they're mad, to calm down. The object was to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. But that doesn't come without its challenges. That doesn't come without difficult people. We have a tendency to feel hopeless but he says there is a powerful combination that if you could embrace that, I promise you it's going to ultimately give you hope. There's a secret here that if you could apply the scriptures in your life, it's going to give you two things. And if you can learn to really work with those two things, it's going to ultimately lead you to one thing, and that is hope. And that is something each and every one of us need more today than we've ever needed before. We need hope. Without hope, we are hopeless. Without hope, we are lost and we are desperate for something greater. We need that hope. There is an element here that is a two-for-one special. The King James calls it patience and comfort. The ESV calls it endurance and encouragement. 
But that word there for patience, it means that this wasn't just a waiting and twiddling our thumbs and lollygagging through life and drudging along with our head hung low and, well, I'm just being patient and I'm waiting on God to show up and do something and show up and move. No, it was a steadfastness. That word there for patient, it was a consistency. It speaks of a man who is not swerved from his purpose and his loyalty to his faith. Even during the greatest trials and suffering, he says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not giving up. I'm not losing hope because I'm pressing for hope. That's the whole purpose of me obtaining this scripture and obtaining this thought is so that I might have hope. The word there for comfort is not this soft, cuddly place. It just makes me feel all good and fuzzy inside. That word is a calling near and exhorting and, and encouraging. It's there to tell you, hey, you can make it. Hey, I believe in you. You can do great things. It's scriptures that are in the word of God that are there to prompt you along and, and help get you to that hope that he's called you to. This doesn't come from some magazine. It doesn't come from some self-help book. It doesn't come from how to have hope for dummies. It comes from Scripture. It comes from the Word of God that if you would open it up from time to time and look at it, you would find that it would help you be steadfast. You would find that it would help you endure some of life's hardest difficulties you will find that the Word of God is as close today as it ever was to being perfect. It's true every single time you open it, and it will speak to right where you are. It'll guide you along the way and point you in the direction that you need to go to. He said this comes through the Scriptures, and if you have these two things, then you have hope. If you have these two components, I promise you there is hope for you yet. But one without the other is not going to get you very far. Paul is dealing with the responsibilities of those within the Christian fellowship to one another. And he's reminding them that there needs to be an awareness that there is a responsibility of the stronger towards the weaker. That you ought to be an encourager and you ought to point somebody to the scriptures. And, you know, we talk about hand-me-downs and we don't like to think about hand-me-downs coming our way. But when we realize how priceless the word of God is and when we've worn that and we've tried it out and it's tested and it's true, then there's somebody that's coming up behind you that may not be where you are, but they're going through something you've gone through. You can say, hey... There was a verse of scripture that just really encouraged me when I went through a trial like you're going through right now. And you can share that word with them. You can pass that down to the next generation that's coming up behind you and saying, hey, I'm telling you, in a season where I felt hopeless in a time where I didn't know if I was going to make it, I went to the Word of God and it spoke to me and it helped me to find patience and comfort in those words. And because of those two things, I was able to find the hope that I needed. There is nothing in this world like being a guinea pig or a test subject. But when you think about it, somebody is going to be the newest surgeon's first case. Lord, help us if it's you. Some of you may not know it, but you may have been on an airplane before, and it may have been that pilot's first day to have a bunch of passengers on board. There's going to be a day where it's somebody's first time, and it might be you that's there in the seat buckled in. And I've been on an airplane before, and they've said, well, this is your captain speaking. This is my first time flying today. I just watched a YouTube tutorial on how to do this, so we should be good to go. And just to get some laughs, and you're sitting there wondering, okay, was this really your first time, or are you just messing with me tonight? But we got where we needed to go, and all is well. But you're, there's times in life where you're going to be somebody's first. Somebody's going to try this out first, and we will let you know how it goes. 
But Paul said, listen, you don't have to walk through life being a guinea pig. You don't have to be the first test subjects. He said, all of these scriptures are written for our instruction. They're tried and true. People have already gone through things in life and we look to them as our example. And we can look at the faithfulness of God and we can look at the wonderful, mighty acts that God already did. And he said, we can look at the scriptures as evidence and proof of his faithfulness. You don't have to go blindly trying to figure it out. You don't have to be the test subject for God. You get to look at the word and, and see things and see stories that you can associate with and say, well, I too know what it's like to lose a loved one. I too know what it's like to be in a storm. I too know what it's like to feel like I'm in a fiery furnace. And you can point to the scriptures and see how they responded. And you can see what worked and you can even see what didn't work. And you can apply that to your life and say, hey, I want to give this a try, but I don't want to do what that guy did. I don't want to lie to the Holy Ghost like Ananias and Sapphira because I saw what happened there. If the Ark of the Covenant showed up in here tonight, we might ooh and all over it, but I ain't touching it because I know what happened to that poor fellow that reached up and took hold of it and he died. And we know these things and there's scriptures that are there for our instruction. In 2 Timothy, the Bible says in verse 16, all scripture, say that, all scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture was given for you. This wasn't some fictional novel. This isn't just another book in the library. This book is divinely breathed in. This wasn't Moses sitting there with ink and paper saying, now what story would I really like to tell them? What things would I really like to make them laugh about or make them cringe about? What could I put down on paper? No, this was God directing him and saying, hey, this is what you need to put down. Because I know there are things you might would like to say, but this is for their instruction. This is for their guidance. And I want it to be God-inspired and God-breathed because there's going to come a day where my very word is going to be challenged and they're going to want to take it out of schools and they're going to take it out of the courthouse and they're going to want to take it out of people's hands. But I want it to be that my word stood the test of time and that it was true today as it was then. Paul said to the church at Rome, whatever was written then was for our instruction. You don't have to wonder or play the guessing game or try to figure out what all was going on. If ever there is a question in your mind, you can go to the scriptures. Every time that I have found myself in a hard situation, I can open up that word and I can go begin to read and God 99.9% .9 of the time is going to lead me right to the place that something's going to speak to me right in the season that I'm in. It's, it's living, it's breathing. And time and time again, God will just boom right there. That verse of the day like Pastor Hughes talked about the other day that was there for that moment that he needed it and then he couldn't find it anymore. Those words that just show up from time to time in your life. Those moments that you're going through something and then you go sit down and you open the word. And it right there, exactly detail for detail what you're going through. And God shows you how to deal with it. How to deal with difficult people. How to deal with people in your family. How to deal with storms in your life and trials and what you need to do and how you need to overcome. All for your instruction. But if you want to know how to live a life with no hope, then don't read the scriptures. Don't go to the word. But if you want to know how to live a life with hope, he said, go to the scriptures. 31,102 verses where you can find throughout two things that point you towards one hope. Throughout scriptures, you're going to find that patient and comfort, and through that, it's going to lead you to hope. 
There are those that only see the Bible as a book of rules and law and thou shalt and thou shalt not. I feel so sorry for those people that, that see the word of God as just this giant rule book. And if that's the way they feel about it, then they obviously have not really read the entire Bible. It's something that somebody has used to shove in their face and point to them about how they're living wrong. And, but when you begin to open the word of God, you'll, you'll see that it's so much more than that. There's, there's stories in there that will lift your spirits. There's encouraging words all throughout Scripture. There's the, the, the cross and the crucifixion and the empty grave that, that gives us hope of a better tomorrow. There's verses about a heavenly place that we can obtain someday. And, and I want to say, where in that is it slamming rules and law down your face? This is beautiful. This is godly. This is wonderful. It's full of wisdom and training and parenting tips and marriage tips and gardening tips. There's all kinds of things in Scripture. There's wars and daily disciplines and personalities that you'll see throughout Scripture. And there's comedy and there's drama. It's the greatest book ever. And when you begin to read it and see it more for what it is opposed to what other people are saying it is, the more you can appreciate the scriptures that are there for you. And within those verses, there is hope to be found. That through steadfastness and consistency and that encouraging comfort that the scriptures bring. Now, I may not always like the pill that the scriptures make me swallow. But time and time again, I can appreciate the words that it speaks over my life because I know that it's right. There's sometimes that that word is sharp and it cuts and it pokes and it, oh. When it tells you to turn the other cheek, when it tells you to bless those who curse you, those things that are kind of opposite to how we feel and it cuts and, oh God, I don't know if I could do that. But the moment that you embrace that, the moment that you take a bucket of water and a towel and you begin to wash somebody's feet and you realize the spirit of humility that comes with that and what that entails and what, what really happens in that moment until you've experienced what the scripture is saying. There's no way to really describe it. But when you have done what the word says and you've taken that pill as tough as it was to swallow, every single time you'll realize how true that word is. It's a lot easier to be an encourager when you're not feeling like you're enduring. Can anybody say amen? amen? It's a whole lot easier when things are great and things are good for you to go, hey man, I feel good. Don't you feel good? Man, you're doing awesome. You keep lifting your hands. You keep praising God. You keep worshiping. But when you've come in and you feel like you've endured, and your head is hung low and you've just been trugging through and you've just been, I'm just, I'm just glad to be here. It's hard to encourage in those moments. It's hard to lift up somebody when you feel like that. And on the flip side, it's a lot easier to endure some things when you're being encouraged. When you are in that state and you say, well, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know. And somebody comes alongside of you and says, hey, I'm proud of you for showing up tonight. Hey, I'm so thankful that you're here on a Wednesday night. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord. I, I believe you're going to make it till Sunday. I believe that God's about to do something great in your life. All of a sudden, that, that one that was hung over and, and enduring and just trying to make it through, all of a sudden they're like, hey, I'm, I'm glad I came tonight. I'm glad I showed up to the house of God. I'm thankful that I heard the word of God preached. We must acknowledge the facts in our life and be a realist without being a pessimist. We can look at life and say, hey, there, there are things that are not always rainbows and butterflies, but that's okay. As long as I go back to the scriptures and I stick to what the word of God says, then I know ultimately there's going to be hope for me at the end of it all. We must acknowledge the facts while clinging to our faith. And saying, I know how big the mountain is, but I know what the word says. I know how big the giant is, but I know what the word says. I know how hot the fire is, but I know what the word says. I know how hungry those lions are, but I know what the word says. And that word is there for my instructions. 
We cannot have that critical, negative, doubting mindset going through this journey. We'll all be miserable. Could you imagine if every person in here was a negative, critical person? And every person that showed up, you just felt like, oh, I'm just enduring. I'm just, you're enduring. Well, I'm enduring worse than you're enduring. I got a family members that, oh, I'm sick. Well, I'm sick worse than you are. I've had it worse than you've had it. I'm, I'm sicker than you've ever been sick. Okay. That's a miserable place to be. If the goal of a Christian is to be Christ-like or a Christ follower, my question tonight is, would God say about the situation what you have been saying about the situation? Next time before you make a comment about what you're going through, look at it and say, would God say the same thing I'm about to say about this? Or how would he view this? We used to say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I say, WWJS, what would Jesus say? Would Jesus go into this? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm here. I am just showed up. I, I'm sure he felt that way sometimes. When you realize how worn out he was and how tired and depleted he was and he finally goes away to pray and they said, hey, Jesus, there's another crowd out here waiting for you. They all need to be healed and touched and prayed for. Whew. Oh, to be like Jesus. The word of God is not meant to harm you. The word of God is not for you to take and harm somebody else. It grieves me so much when I see people take the word of God and, and try to twist it to get their agenda across and to use it to beat somebody over the head and show them all the laws and the rules and, and they're sitting there pointing at the speck in somebody's eye when there's a beam in theirs. Don't ever let us do that with the word of God. A man will be won much more easily by surrounding him with an atmosphere of love than by attacking him with the battery of criticism. Well, I'm not saying we go around and we coddle them, and I'm not saying we just accept all of the sin and all of the things about their life. It doesn't mean you condone their choices or their lifestyle, and it certainly doesn't mean that you water down that word to appease them. Because what would happen is you would not just water down the word. You in turn would water down their patience. And in turn, you would also water down their comfort. And what they would be left with would be a watered down hope. We've got to make sure that we speak the truth in love. That we take the word of God and we don't beat them over the head with it, but we sit down at a table with them and we break bread with them and we say, hey, I know where you're at. I felt, I felt the same thing you did when I first came into the church. I had the same questions about why would God do this and how did this happen? I had those same thoughts and sit down with them and go through scripture that are there for our instruction and say, see, when you have all this working for you, you too can have hope. What they need to hear is the truth spoken to them in a loving way and in support and you encouraging them of their attempt to live right. We have all been there where we needed comfort in our sorrow and encouragement in our struggle. And there is a difference in coddling and comfort. And that's a whole other message in and of itself. One commentary said it like this, the patience and endurance is far more than patience. It is the triumphant adequacy which can cope with life. It is the strength which does not only accept things, but which in accepting them transmutes them into glory. I thought that was so beautiful. We struggle with some of these things and we are not the first nor will we be the last. That is why Paul was addressing the issue. It's easy to view endurance as a thing that we just, we just barely make it and we come in looking like we feel and feeling like we look. But endurance is so much more than that. When you have the word and you have consistency in your life, it's what helps the people of God be resilient. It's what helps us cope with things differently than other people cope with things. I, I see people that, that lose a loved one 
and do not know God. And I see the trouble and the questions in their mind. And while it's hard either way, I am so thankful to know that in those times I know God. I'm so thankful to know that in the storms of life that there is words that I can go to and comfort that I can find that will help me endure life struggles. I can't imagine going through this life without him. I can't imagine trying to live this life without the word of God for me to go to in those times. It doesn't remove the trouble, but it helps us live through the trouble. Then we have that comfort, that encouragement. Ikea and many others, Brother Andrew, there's that other picture of the two plants. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. But there were all these studies done of the plants. And literally, they had it where kids would put these in their classrooms. And different companies would have this in different corners of the building. Same plant, same sunlight, same water, same treatment for both plants. Except people would go over to one plant and say, You're stupid. You're ugly. You're no good. You're never going to make it. You're not going to thrive. You're never going to survive all of this. And they'd go to the other plant and say, hey, you're beautiful. Hey, you're great. You're wonderful. I'm sure you'd feel pretty silly sitting there talking to a plant. But the outcome with every single one of them was what you see it before you. They've done this in elementary schools. They've done this different places. This was Ikea that did this one. Just to prove a point that there's power in what you say. There's power in what you Speak, And you say, well, that's silly to talk like that. Really? Because the Bible says that death and life are in the power of the tongue. You have the ability to tear things down or build things up. And it is a whole lot easier to go through this life with encouragement that gives you hope than it is where there is none. I'm not talking about stroking your ego or feeding into narcissism. I'm talking about coming alongside those around you and letting them know, hey, you're going to make it. Hey, you're going to be all right. Hey, everything the word says says that you can be an overcomer. Now, if you cannot walk without somebody constantly cheering you on and, oh, Brother Junior, I'm so glad just to, just eat every step you take so wonderful. Every time, oh, you're just so awesome. If you, if you have to have that 24-7, you have a problem. Now, on the flip side of that, if you walk every day of your life and not one person ever comes alongside of you and says, hey, I appreciate you. Hey, you can make it. Hey, I'm so thankful that you're here today. Then there is also a problem. I can tell you that there are seasons in life you feel like you have endured all you can endure and you are not going to make it. But then comes the encourager. Somebody who steps in and lifts your spirit. Someone who smiles and believes in you. Even when you endured all you thought you could. We used to be on a deer lease with this guy. Who had an old Ford truck. And in that old Ford truck. There was not one. But two gas tanks on that thing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They don't make those anymore. But man, every vehicle I had been in wasn't like that. But we're driving there one day, chugging along, and he flips the switch. I said, what was that? That was the second gas tank. I just turned that switch, and boom, there we go. We're rocking and rolling. And I thought, that is the coolest thing I think I've ever seen in my life. It amazed me, that, that young kid in the back seat of that truck, just flip a switch, and boom, you're ready to roll some more. Wouldn't it be nice if life had that button? That when you, oh boy, I'm worn out, I'm tired. I'm, whoa, yes, I'm ready to go some more. Just a flip of a switch and you got a full tank, you're ready to rock and roll. Hallelujah. Amen. That would be wonderful. That's what's so amazing about scriptures. That's what's so beautiful about friendships and relationships within the body of Christ. Because you do have that. You do have two components working for you at all times. If you would go to the word of God, that both work together for your good to give you hope. It's what's be beautiful about the body of Christ. I've got twins, that two for one special. And one of those is shorter than the other one, who is the older of the two. 
Poor Cohen. He will cry. He will get mad. He will get so... It's not fair. I'm 11 minutes older. How come he is taller than me? How come he's always taller than me? And it's just this big, long deal. And I said, Cohen, he may be taller than you, but you have a whole lot more vocabulary words than he does. Oh, yeah, you're right. I know a lot of words. I can say a lot of things. I, I've got a lot of things in my mind, and I'm, I'm smart. And I, yeah, yeah, see, you have all that working for you. And he's got the height working for him. But it's these teachable moments, even with these young guys. Hey, we're all created with special giftings and abilities. God didn't make any one of us like. It takes you and you working together so something better can come of this. And God is saying through Paul, hey, if you would let my word do what it needs to do, it's going to give you patience and comfort that are going to work together to give you hope. Let's stand all over this house tonight. Scripture said if one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. There's a river in Switzerland fed by two uniting streams bearing the same name, one of them called the white and one of them called the gray or the dark. One comes down from the glaciers and bears half-melted snow in its white ripple. The other flows through a lovely valley and is discolored by its earth. They unite in one common current. So it is in these two components that we have. Patience and comfort that come down together and flow into one hope. Through one direction we have the brave perseverance and the other sweet consolation. We cannot find that hope among our sorrows and difficulties except by reason of this connecting link between endurance and encouragement. We cannot go from the island of hopelessness to the shores of hopeful without the word of God, without those scriptures that we can lean on. But with his word, it becomes a bridge from despair to hope. And scriptures will show us the purpose behind the pain. Scriptures come from him and they come for my good. The word of God is deep enough that it appeases the intellect of the smartest of men. And yet it's simple enough that a small child can read it and it touch their lives. It's sharp enough it can cut away things in my life that do not belong. And yet it's soft enough that hearts half paralyzed by sorrow can take it in. Grief and pain are going to be such a common thing in our lives. And their cure had need to be easily obtained also. Not a path that leads you to either endurance and another path that leads you to encouragement, but a book full of encouraging words, full of promise, full of blessings, a book that will lead you to both, all that you might have hope. I'm so thankful for the word of God. I'm so thankful for the words that were written for our instruction. I'm so thankful for each and every line that, that God inspired into men to write down because he knew the days that you would face. He knew the sorrow that you would feel, the grief that you would have to overcome, the loss that you would suffer. And God said, I, I know what they're going to go through. I know the struggles they're going to face. And I, I want to write some things down in this book so that it will, it will be something that they can turn to. And when they turn to it, it will give them patience and, and comfort in their life. That it will help them stay the course in this journey that they might have hope. Without one or the other, there is no hope. But when the two work together, it's God's two for one special. And he says, both of these things are for your hope and for your good. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for every promise that was within those pages that are still yes and amen. We thank you for the encouragement that we see throughout Scripture, Lord, that keep us lifted, God, in days where our head hangs low. God, I pray tonight, God, that you would reach down and remind us, oh God, point us to that verse that we need. Point us back to Scripture. God, and help us also to those that are weaker than us and coming alongside of us in their journey. 
God, that we could point them to scriptures and we could sit down in Bible studies, oh Lord, and talk to them about the goodness and faithfulness of God and show them the words that you wrote down, that you breathed upon men and inspired them to put down, God, for our instruction so that we could go through this life knowing that we have hope. God, we treasure it tonight. God, I cling to your word. It means so much to me. Every day within its pages, God, there is more to be found. Time and time again, God, you can go read the same verse 12 times over, and each time you find something new and something different. God, I'm thankful that it's alive and it's breathing and it's moving and it speaks to us even here tonight. God, we thank you for that word and we praise you for it tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Everybody give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's why Wednesday nights are so important. You say, well, we just come and just hear the word. Well, what else would you want to hear? I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful for what it speaks over our lives. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord tonight. Love somebody. Let them know how glad you are that they are here, and we will see you Sunday. God bless you.